Well, thanks for joining. Welcome back to the show. It's been an interesting week. A few things that I want to highlight from this week is if you watched the last episode I did, I showed a clip of a guy losing about $50,000 in 10 seconds using an exploit from Robinhood. Yeah, this made the news. Lots of CNBC commentators talking about it. I'm going to be taking a look at that. Then we have an interview with David Calhoun. He is the chairman of Boeing. And he comes and explains a lot of the things going on with Boeing. And I think he gives a really good interview. I'm going to be responding to some of this. And of course, we have my portfolio, my dividend growth portfolio, and I have the statement for the month of October. So I'll be showing you how much money I've made every single month in dividends and which way that's trending. So I'll tell you how much I made in October. But there's a main subject that I want to hit on before getting into any of those news items. This is an email. I get a lot of emails during the week. I can't respond to all of them, so I'm sorry if you write in. But I try to address ones that I, I see common themes, common questions throughout. And this is one of the most common ones I get. It's mostly from new investors. They're deciding to invest, but they're concerned because they hear a lot of bad news. This one's from Justin. He says, hey, Joseph, really enjoy the videos. Thank you for taking time out of your life to help educate people like myself. I'll be turning 30 in January and have never invested before, but really want to get started. Paying off my credit card debt is my main focus as my initial deposits would be low, goal of 50 to $100 a month. With all the talk about a looming recession, I'm worried that whatever I invest will be lost when the market turns. Is this something I'm overthinking? So Justin, this is a very common concern, especially among new investors just entering the market. Your exact question. With all the talk about a looming recession, I'm worried that whatever I invest will be lost when the market turns. Is this something I should be concerned with? When you're investing, you're doing something different than you've probably ever done with your finances before. This is why it's so difficult for people that are outside of the investment world to actually enter into it. Because when you're on the outside, you go and you you have an agreement with your employer to make a certain amount of money, usually paid out every two weeks, right? Every month or whatever it is. And you get your direct deposit, the exact amount that you agree to. You go to the grocery store or to whatever store you want. You pick out your groceries and the exchange of value is extremely clear and it's guaranteed. Meaning you pick out your groceries, you purchase them, you know, the exact price you're paying for them. And if there's any problems with it, you can return things to the store. Everything is guaranteed there. The value exchange is extremely clear. With the stock market, it's the first time that you're actually spending your money and buying shares that you don't know whether it's going to go up in value or down in value. You don't know whether that money is going to lose value next year or gain value next year. And there's no returns. If you buy something in the stock market and it drops 20% in value, you can't go ahead and say, hey, I want to I want to have a return on this. So there is inherent risk existing in the stock market that a lot of new investors are not used to. You're just not used to putting your money at risk. And sometimes that brings a lot of fears and concerns about jumping in right now, especially when there's all of this bad news and bad headlines going on. Now with my portfolio you're looking at here, this is an M1 Finance portfolio. There's a link to the exact holdings. You can click into each of these pies. There's a link to that in the description if you're interested in it. But with my portfolio, I realized that in investing in general, there's really only a couple things you actually have control over. If you think about this with me for a second, you have control over what you buy. So you can pick out the exact holdings. You can assign allocations to them. And so you can pick out what you want to buy. And then you can pick out when you want to buy it. And then you can pick out when you want to sell it. Those are the only things you have control over. You don't have control over the price. You don't have control over the economy or if they go up or down in value. You have no say in that. Now, I'm aware of the bad news that goes on in the headlines that makes new people stay out of the market. The news that we have an upcoming predicted recession in 2020, that we have trade wars with China, that we have, you know, an entire political party that has all sorts of financial policies that we don't really know how it would affect the economy. And, you know, we pass a yield curve inversion and on and on and on. There's all this different negative news that we're constantly getting blasted with. And a lot of times it keeps new investors out of the market. They never really want to enter. The strategy that I'm personally choosing to follow is I'm deciding a deposit schedule called dollar cost averaging. You might have heard that term. It's also uh, shortened to DCA online all the time, but dollar cost averaging is pretty simple. I'll play like a 30 second clip that explains it here. Dollar cost averaging is a more conservative approach to investing than simply spending all your money on securities at once. This technique allows investors to commit to a fixed dollar amount of a particular investment on a regular schedule, regardless of the share price. More shares will be bought when prices are lower and fewer shares will be bought when prices are higher, resulting in a lower average cost per share. Dollar cost averaging reduces risks by allowing investors to ease into the market over time. That's, that's really it. That's all it is. Dollar cost averaging means that 
even if you had a hundred thousand dollars you would just slowly feed that into your portfolio on an incremental schedule over time now i'm assuming because you have credit card debt that you're working on paying off that you don't have a hundred thousand dollars sitting around but the same strategy applies you can take a portion of your paycheck like the 50 or 100 dollars that you're talking about and slowly feed that into your portfolio and that way even if we do have a recession next year it doesn't matter assuming that you can stay employed or find a new job if you end up losing your job in a recession you can continue to dollar cost average into the market and since we have a recession and presumably equities would go down in value you'd be able to purchase all these different equities at reduced costs. If I look at my portfolio, I'll show you the deposits that I've done. This is the activity page where it shows everything that's going on. Most of this is dividends that I'm paid because this is a, a dividend centric, different, a dividend growth portfolio. But if I go up here and I filter by deposits and withdrawals, I haven't done any withdrawals, so these are all deposits. It has the date on the left here, so this is October, September, August, a little bit of July. And you can see a $1,000 deposit, 2,000, 500, so on and so forth, just thousands of dollars being put into it. And this just goes on for page after page. But I'm not a millionaire. I don't have a huge amount of money sitting on the side that I'm slowly feeding into this. What I'm doing is I'm taking a portion of my income from my job and from any source that I have, and I'm putting some of that into savings and some of that into investing, exactly as you describe as dollar cost averaging. So every single month, I just put in a portion of my income into my portfolio. And the advantages of that is it just averages out the market. Whether it goes up or down, as long as you continue dollar cost averaging, you just average out the market. It's a very proven, easy, mathematically beneficial way to invest. Now, I realize some of you might think I'm crazy for investing this much money into the stock market when we're at uh, like 10 years in a bull run and we have all this bad news expected to happen, right? We have all these bad news headlines and these things going on in the world that are kind of scary. But I look at stories like this. This is the fictional tale of three different people, Tiffany, Brittany, and Sarah. And a lot of you have seen this before, but it's very illustrative of the importance of not selling and staying invested. It says each of them invested over the last 40 years, 1979 to 2019, but they had different strategies about when to jump into the market. They examined four different market crashes, Black Tuesday, the Kuwait War, the dot-com crash, and the financial crisis, right? Each one of those, the market went down a lot, like at least 20%, most of them over 30%. Now, Tiffany is the world's worst investor. Each of them got $200 a month. And what Tiffany did is she got her $200 a month, she saved that up in a savings account, and then she dumped all of that money into the market that she had saved the day before the market had one of those crashes, each one of them. At the end of it, as long as she never sold, which is the key sentence there, she did never sell, she had $663,000. That's from $96,000. So 96 grand turned into $663,000, even though she invested at the worst possible times in the market, the day before the crashes began. Then we have Brittany. This is the one where she's the best market timer in the world. What she did is she sat her money into a 3% interest savings account. So this is a high yield savings account. And she gathered their money up and she put it into the market at the very bottom day of each of those four market crashes. Well, she made a little bit more money. She got $956,000. That's better than what Tiffany did. So Brittany so far is in the lead. But let's look at another strategy here, dollar cost averaging. This is where Sarah comes in. They call it slow and steady. That's another way for saying I'm dollar cost averaging. Pretty much I'm slowly feeding some of my paycheck into the market on a residual basis. Sarah didn't have much interest in watching the market or trading. In fact, she only did one thing. On the day she opened her account in 1979, she set up a $200 per month auto investment in an index fund and never looked at her account again. Today, Sarah's account is worth 1,386,000. So she never spent time letting it sit in a savings account and she never sold. That was key. As long as you're constantly dollar cost averaging in, you're never selling and you're not letting your money sit there and earn a two or 3% in a savings account, you're going to come out on top. And just to add to this, we have 600,000 for the worst timer. We have like 960,000 for the best timer. And then the person that dollar cost average, we have 1.3 million. The person that would have just kept that into the 3% savings account made 186,000. That's the difference. The problem with looking at risk in the marketplace, of trying to time when the market will do good and when the market will do bad, is the longer you have your money sitting out of the market, the longer you don't have it working for you. Every year that passes by is another year you could have had that money working for you. And if you never invest, you're guaranteed to lose. That's a guaranteed lose. So if you're looking at risk, 
you could put your money in the stock market and then we could have like the U.S. economy fail drastically or something like that happen. And you could, quote unquote, lose all your money. If you never put your money in the market, you're guaranteed to not have enough money to retire unless you make a ridiculous salary or, you know, you start your own business and I guess invest that way. If you never invest in the stock market, it doesn't really matter. It's always been worse to leave money in savings than it has been long term to put it into investments. So I look at this and I know that I might be buying at a bad time. I don't know what's going to happen next year with the market, but frankly, I don't really care. If the market goes into a recession next year, sure, this number will turn red. I'll keep buying shares. I think the companies that I buy will be able to last through them. So you have to buy quality companies that will make it through a recession. But as long as you do that or you buy ETFs, you don't have to worry about whether you're having a recession or not. The only thing you have to worry about is not selling and locking in those losses when the market goes down. In your email, Justin, part of the wording, you say, with the talk about a looming recession, I'm worried that whatever I invest will be lost. Lost. The way that you have permanent loss in the stock market, there's a couple ways this happened. One is you invest in something that goes completely bankrupt or default, meaning you buy some kind of loan and the company goes bankrupt. That's one way to lose money. But if you're buying S&P 500 companies, these are the biggest companies in the world. If you're diversified with a, a lot of different ones, it's very unlikely that you're going to actually lock in losses with a lot of these companies going out of business. It would have to be something that we've never faced before for all the biggest American companies in the world to go completely bankrupt. So that's one concern of having a permanent loss. But the more likely one is you selling at a loss. That is the most likely way that you will ever face a permanent loss in the stock market is if you start dollar cost averaging in, if things are going good, and then we hit a 20%, 30% decline, and then you lock that in by selling. That's the way that most people really lose money in the stock market. So to answer your question of whether I would worry about an upcoming recession, of whether you start investing now, my answer would be no. I would start investing today. I would start putting money in now. The people that are making predictions about what the economy is going to do in one year or two years or three years, they have no idea what the economy will do. We might have a 100% gain next year. They have zero idea. A lot of the people that have the best arguments about how the Fed is in, you know, inflating things, there's all these big bubbles, everything's all drastic. They've been making those arguments for six years. And during that time, the stock market has gone up 300%. And the people that have sat their money on the outsides have missed out on tremendous amounts of wealth generation during that time period. So my advice, the strategy that I'm doing is I'm keeping invested all the time with the mentality that eventually we will hit a recession. Our portfolios don't only go up, they will eventually go down as well. And that's okay. That's part of a normal economic cycle. There's times where we overconsume, times where we have to underconsume. So just go on with that mentality that you're going to feed money slowly into your portfolio. And whether the market goes up or down, that's not something you can control. I don't like concerning myself too much with things that aren't in my control. Okay, so moving on from that question, I wanted to also just give a quick update on my portfolio. So for the past week, I've been down a little bit, 300 bucks. This is mostly because unlike the S&P 500, I'm really weighted towards real estate and real estate doesn't always trade with the rest of the market. Sometimes it goes up and down, totally independent of the market. So since I have 20% of that and 20% of the bonds, both of them fell a little bit, that's where the portfolio went down. But if I look at this, I'm earning $46 a week in dividends. And then I got the statement from M1 of how much money I earned in October. So part of that is I actually started a website. This is josephcarlsonshow.com. In it, I wrote one little blog piece, a, a basic guide to M1 Finance specifically. But if you go to this website, this is josephcarlsonshow.com. It'll have two links up here. If you click on portfolio, this is pretty cool. You can see my actual monthly income. And this isn't just like an image independent of my actual Google spreadsheet. This is literally a publication of it. So whenever I update my Google spreadsheet, this will publish it onto this website and anybody can check this anytime. So I just wanted to make it as transparent as possible. You can go and it's actually interactive. Like you can go and highlight the different parts of this. And for the month of October, I made $183.85 in dividends. This is my main thing that excites me. This is what I like about this portfolio is I can see the amount of passive income that I'm generating go up month over month. So you can see this trend continue to go up and I'm trying to get over $200. I think eventually I'll get there, but I'm not in any huge hurry. Regardless, this is fun to see. $183.85 made from completely passive income. I did nothing for that. I didn't work for that at all. It just is money paid out to me. I get to reinvest it back in my portfolio. It's pretty awesome to see. 
Now I also have my portfolio value here. You can look on this and it's the same thing. This is live charts updated every time that I update it on my Google spreadsheet. So you can go to this website and look at it anytime you want. And then another cool thing here, I'm starting a timeline right here. You can see November 4th where I'm showing the most recent update to my portfolio and any changes I make. So anybody that's following the portfolio and they wanna know any changes I'm making in my holdings or the percentages of, I'm just gonna create a log here. So the next time I make a change, I'll make another entry with the date, with the updated link. You can click on this link here and it brings you straight to my portfolio where it shows you all the details about it. You can click in and see any of the holdings. But I'm gonna be doing this and keeping a timeline of all the changes I make. So you can see the most recent link to the portfolio here, as well as I have a description of everything I changed so you don't have to like look through and try to compare it and see the changes I made. So if that's of any interest, that is just to be more transparent to show exactly what I'm invested in, exactly when I make changes, exactly how much money I'm making from this portfolio. This is what I've always said is the main goal, the main indicator I look at, is how much passive income I'm making. Now moving on from that, I have to give an update on our favorite Robinhood user here. This is the one that he did this intentionally. This is no mistake. He exploited a problem with Robinhood that allowed you to gain massive amounts of margin that you weren't supposed to have. So just like putting up a couple thousand of your own money, you could pretty much gamble with like $50,000 of Robin Hoods or more. Now, this video, you can see he's losing $50,000 in just a few seconds here. I showed this video last week. Well, this made the news and CNBC has been talking about this glitch and Josh Brown has a lot of harsh things to say towards the community that's been doing this. So Someone... Robin Hood is going to pay if Robin Hood is going to pay fines. They're going to get in trouble. Just for people watching at home, this isn't like Robin Hood getting people to take more risk than they want to. Here's what these kids are doing and they're psychopaths. He just called the Wall Street Bets community psychopaths, which is just great. Uh, I mean, the people doing this kind of are. Because if you look at this, there are some posts about people using twenty or $50,000 like that other one that we just looked at, like he did. But then there's somebody that posted about how they used $4,000 of their own money to gamble with over a million dollars worth of margin. So that is extremely exploitive. Him calling this person a psychopath, I don't know if it's too far off. This is not like something where somebody accidentally walks and falls into a hole. You have to be deliberately trying to do this. So that's the first thing. So it's not like every Robin Hood customer is at, at risk. So I just think it's important. Like, there's no way they wanted this. Because if one of these kids blows up an account, Robin Hood's out the money. These kids yeah. aren't coming in to make a margin call for a million dollars. So I just think, like, yeah, they'll pay a fine. But let's not act like they're like trying to hurt anyone. I think it's very oh. clear they have the most to lose. Robinhood is the most to lose. Okay, so moving on from Robinhood, um, on to Boeing here. So this is the chairman of Boeing, David Calhoun. He gave an interview with CNBC. And this was interesting because he came in as a chairman when this whole debacle happened with the second plane crashing. Uh, Dennis Millenberg was removed as chairman just to focus on his role as the CEO. Now, I showed a clip of Dennis Mullenberg going before Congress. I showed a few clips, but one of them was a senator asking Dennis Mullenberg directly, why are you still taking a salary? Why are you still taking bonuses and stock when your companies had this disastrous thing happen and all these lives lost? You know, the Japanese, they wouldn't want to be paid if this happened under their watch, right? The CEO doesn't take a, a payment if this happens. And this question was brought up to David Calhoun really quickly in this interview. Um, big question right off the bat is about the compensation for Dennis Mullenberg. This came up on Capitol Hill. You, you have some news regarding how that's going to be changing, correct? Yeah, I do. Um, of course, it was sort of obvious to everyone that was an uncomfortable question for Dennis. Uh, Dennis doesn't like to speak in behalf of board activities. Um, uh, anyway, Dennis called me uh, Saturday morning, um, 10 o'clock. Um, with the purpose of suggesting that he uh, not take any compensation for 2019 as in, in the form of bonuses, which is, of course, most of your compensation. Um, it came in two fronts. One, no short, no long-term bonus. And three, no consideration for equity grants until the max in its entirety is back in the air and flying safely. Um, as you know, uh, max in its entirety uh, takes us through all of the next calendar year um, and probably into the beginning of 2021. So I thought that this was pretty cool to hear that Dennis was going to be giving up his compensation, at least a huge majority of it. Most of it is made up by stock options and bonuses. And he's going to be giving that up for 2019. And then what looks like could be all of 2020 and then into some of 2021. So that's a pretty 
good sacrifice, you know. I guess that he still makes a lot of money outside of that. He probably has plenty of money. But giving up that much money, which could be 30 plus million dollars, I think is a, a pretty good move on his part. It'll come off PR wise as a pretty good thing, but I think it's a good practice in general from leadership that he was the CEO during the time this happened. It was totally unacceptable. So he should fill it personally in some way. He should be responsible in some way. At another point in this interview, he gets asked about the safety of the airplane. If this airplane can even be salvaged is the word that he uses. And he says, you know, this brand is damaged. The 737 Max, it's a damaged brand. Is it going to be safe? Are people going to trust it? And this is how he responds to it. This airplane has been updated several times over the course of its, uh, its tenure out there, um, always with the latest technology and safety uh, regu- uh, requirements in mind. So it is a modern airplane, um, and this control system will be fixed, and it will be safe, and it will have been tested like no other control system, in, at least in my history in the aviation industry. Um, And this airplane will will fly and it will be safe and I'll fly it and my family will fly it and uh, There's the only way to win a brand back is not to advertise it or to talk about it But to win it with every next flight and every touch it will be called the max it will be called the max So he answers all these questions. I think the right way he says that this plane will be safe that he will fly on it his family will fly on it and I, I think I agree with him on that that Boeing knows if they have any issue, if one of these planes crashes again, the the damage to the reputation of Boeing would be exponential. They would never be able to come back from it. So this is going to be one of the most rigorously tested planes ever. It'll probably be one of the safer ones in the air that ironically, a lot of people like intentionally avoid just because of the history with this. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But overall, this interview is very good. If you watch the whole thing, I think it instills some confidence in Boeing investors. I think he did extremely good answering these questions. Okay, let's move on to some questions here. Joseph Carlson show at gmail.com is the email address. You can also leave a comment in YouTube. I read all of those as well as message me on Instagram or Twitter. The first one is from AMDS. He says, But what happens if I invest a lot of money over years and Robinhood goes bankrupt or something happens 15 or 20 years, will I lose all my money? Okay, well, this is an easy question, but an important one. This is, again, you're you're putting your money in something, you know, you're concerned about it. This is all new stuff to investing. So these are common questions. What happens if Robinhood or M1 Finance, these are smaller companies, right? These are tech startups. And sometimes tech startups go bankrupt. That does happen. Now, Robinhood and M1 Finance aren't invulnerable to going bankrupt or having something like that happen. But what they do have is they have SIPC insurance, meaning that your investments are insured by the government, not that they will gain or lose value, but that you actually have those investments. Now, it's important to remember that when you buy something through a brokerage like Robinhood or M1 Finance, they don't own your money. They don't own the thing that they bought. They are a broker. What a broker does is they broker transactions. It's like a real estate broker. They don't own the home when you buy a home through a real estate agent. They're just brokering a transaction. That is the role that your stock broker is doing, is they're making it so that it's easier for you to purchase stock on an exchange. So you have to separate the roles. If any of these companies were to go bankrupt, they would simply transfer your holdings over to a different brokerage or they would liquidate them for you. And that has happened in the past where some brokers go out of business, It's a very simple process. They say, would you like us to move your portfolio, all your holdings over to a different brokerage? If so, which one? Let us know. Or would you like us to liquidate it and just put it in your bank account? So you really just pick what happens at that point. I don't suspect either of these companies are going to go bankrupt anytime soon, but it's not even a risk if they do. If they do go bankrupt, then other brokers will really want my money and I'll be able to transfer it over to them. Kayla says, Good evening, my name is Kayla. I'm 28 years old and I began dividend investing about six weeks ago and every two weeks I've invested anywhere from $100 to $200. Uh, That's just like the examples we showed. They put in $200 a a month, so she's investing a little bit more, but that's dollar cost averaging into the market. So good job on that, Kayla. She says, I have 10 companies that I've bought into. My question is, would it still be beneficial to continue to diversify and add more companies into my portfolio if all I can really invest is $100 to $200 a week? There are many companies I'd like to invest in, but my concern is I have... So she's saying, should I limit it to 10 companies since I'm only able to put in a relatively small amount of money every two weeks? Um, Well, I shouldn't say small amount of money. $200 every two weeks is actually quite a bit of money. But 
Putting that into 10 companies, I think is pretty good. So Kayla, I don't think you have to add on 30 to 40 companies. There's a lot of studies, a lot of data that shows that as long as all the companies you're holding aren't in the exact same sector, like if they're, you know, if they're 10 different oil companies, yes, you're not properly diversified. But assuming you have different companies that are in a variety of different sectors, really once you get past the point of like 15 to 20, you are diversified as you're gonna get. If you get beyond that, it doesn't really, you don't really gain the benefits of diversification that much. So I have like 45 companies. I could reduce that quite a bit and still have the benefits of diversification. I just have those companies. I haven't decided to sell them. I am at the point with my portfolio where I have a decent amount in each one. But if you're starting off, I do not see any reason that you should really worry about putting money in more than 10 companies. Once you get up to higher dollar amounts, you might want to increase that to maybe 15 or 20, but you don't really even need to push it too much further than that. David is King says, videos are great as always. Interested to see the portfolio in a time of recession. Uh, well, first of all, I appreciate you saying the videos are great as always. And this comment had 31 thumbs up. And I like to look at comments that have a lot of thumbs up because I like to see what people are interested in. And I agree with you, David. I'm interested as well in seeing how my portfolio does during a recession. But I think there's going to be a disconnect. I think a lot of people will look at it and they will think that the gauge of how my portfolio does is how much in value it falls during a recession. That's not really the primary indicator of success or failure I'm gonna be looking at with my portfolio. The main thing I'm gonna be looking at is what my dividend income does. How many companies cut their dividends? If my dividend income holds pretty steady or only drops a little bit while the rest of the market's going down, I'm gonna consider that success. If every company's cutting their dividends and removing their dividend payments, I'm gonna consider that failure. So that's gonna be kind of the gauge that I look at is the dividend income that's been the focus since the beginning. It'll continue to be the focus during a recession, not so much the market cap of the companies. Dennis says, Joseph, as always, appreciate your time and effort in making the videos. I'm a beginner in M1 coming from Robinhood having transferred money over. How do you dollar cost average with auto invest turned on? Can you dive a little deeper into your process of depositing money, adding to positions and balancing your portfolio? Also, to not create taxable events, how often do you rebalance your entire portfolio? Much love, Dennis. Okay, Dennis, the first question you say, how do you dollar cost average with auto invest turned on? That is really the easiest part of it. That's what I like about M1 a lot is that it has the auto invest feature. I can literally just flip that on. Then all the dividends that I have streaming into my portfolio are constantly being reinvested. And the way the auto invest feature works is it automatically puts that money into the underweight holdings in your portfolio. So you have target allocations for every single holding. All of them want to be at a certain point. And what AutoInvest does is automatically identifies the companies that are underweight and it prioritizes your money going to those first. So I just leave that on and then any money I deposit, any dividends, it goes into the holdings that M1's AutoInvest feature decides. The next question you say, can you dive a little deeper into your process of depositing money adding to positions and balancing your portfolio. Um, my deposit schedule, like I showed, I do dollar cost averaging, which means I make money throughout the year. I just have that money in a bank account. Once I decide, hey, this is uh, enough money to deposit a little bit into my portfolio, I'll just do a deposit. So I don't really look at what the market is doing. I don't look at really if it's a down week or an up week. Sometimes I might put a little bit more in if like the market falls a little bit, but most of the time it's just when I have extra money I can put in. That has been my deposit schedule. There's not much rhyme or reason to it other than I don't have as many expenses this month so I can put in a little bit more or next month I do have some expenses so I put in a little bit less. That's really all I do is I just put in the free amount of money I have. The last part you say to not create taxable events, how often do you rebalance your portfolio? I never really rebalance my portfolio. So that manual rebalance button, I don't think I really ever hit. And the reason why is because it will start to sell shares if you do that. And you don't need to rebalance your portfolio that way because if you're doing a dividend growth investing portfolio, you're gonna have a stream of cash and with your deposits, that'll be enough that over time it, it keeps your portfolio in balance. So that is the nice thing about the auto invest feature is like I said, it keeps your portfolio in balance by putting that money into the underweight securities so you never have to actually click that rebalance button that would go ahead and sell overweight holdings. You just put future funds into underweight holdings until it gets up to that target allocation. All right, this is the last one I'll do. This is from a user named Subsonic is his account name. He says, 
I've been going back and watching some of your content previous to when I subscribed, and I'm really impressed with the poise of knowledge at your age. I'm more than twice your age, and at 30, I was pursuing my passion of flying airplanes for a regional airline and making peanuts as a captain. Finance was not even remotely in the picture. It wasn't until in my 40s that I got interested in trading and then went through the whole process of a day trader, swing trader, option buyer, option seller, this software, that software, this course, that course. You get the picture. Meanwhile, most of the time was spent as a break-even trader. It took my brain seven years to learn that my personality did not match what I was trying to do. You can make money day trading, but realistically, it's a small percentage of traders that are mentally wired to do that. I finally settled on a strategy similar to yours, but I use puts to control risk, but the goal is collecting and reinvesting dividends. What young people have today is absolutely amazing and a real tangible advantage in terms of the march of technology. When I was 30, there was no internet we had access to. The first personal computers were just coming out. Steve Jobs was forming Apple, etc. Now you have channels like yours helping people in search of information, keep up the good work. When you are my age, you're going to have a massive dividend machine. Well, Subsonic, I appreciate the comment here. And I think it's cool to get different perspectives. You know, having somebody that's a little bit older than me now, looking back and seeing the differences now, I think is cool. One of the things I like about this YouTube channel in particular is that the demographic range that I have, I look at the analytics and the demographics of my viewers, and it's a huge range. So we have very young people, very old people, everybody in between, different income levels, people from all different parts of the world. And I get a lot of different perspectives with that. Uh, I do think it's true. A lot of the things you're saying where, you know, you say that we have a lot of advantages. We have state-of-the-art brokers that are easy to use and they're free. We have a lot of information on YouTube, like this channel that shows simple ways to invest. So it's not a situation where you have to go through the whole financial industry and pay money for it. But I also want to highlight one part of your, your comment there where you say that you went through the whole day trading phase for about seven years before you realized that you're chasing your tail. Um, I realize when I bring up day trading, there's always people that comment and say, you know, not everything with day trading is risky. There's responsible ways to use it. You know, not everything with options is risky. Okay, I, I get that. I understand not everything you can do with options is inherently risky. My point is, is that I think day trading is not investing. When you're going in and you're trying to game the stock market by doing these specific strategies to try to make a quick return, I don't think that's investing. That's not what I show on my channel. It's not what I'm interested in. I don't think it's good for most people. On top of that, what I see from the entire industry, from even other YouTubers, is I think it's a very uh, kind of spammy oriented industry where a lot of the products people push are very expensive. They share these different courses that are $400 a course to learn the specific ways and the seminars and the, you know, the courses and the, the specific ways that they made all this money. It's, it's a bunch of garbage in my opinion. I think that that money could be better spent investing in profitable companies that pay out their shareholders over a period of time. So that's my opinion on it. I will never tell a family member to go and take a course on day trading and try to learn making money that way. So I'm not going to tell any viewers the same thing. What I do tell my family members and what I do tell my viewers is that I think that you should pick out companies that are profitable companies that have good growth prospects and buy a portion of them and enjoy receiving dividends over and over again. That is what investing is. That's what capitalism is. It's buying a portion of profitable businesses that will grow over time and enjoy reaping in the rewards of it. So that's what I show on the channel. It's pretty simple and I don't have to sell a course to explain it. Anyway, that's gonna be all for this video. If you guys haven't already, hit the subscribe button, like the video. You can also, if you wanna chat with me directly, you can join the Discord and, and join the conversation there. We have a good group of people. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next time.